All right. We have a, a guy that's been with us for like a long time as one of our missionaries. I think we supported him from when he first went on the field. We've helped him build a, a house there that ministers to children uh, in Indonesia. And this is Doug Hollis. So would you put your hands together and welcome this missionary. And thank the Lord for you, Doug. God bless you. Shall I go up front here? Thank you, Pastor Weaver. I feel like I'm at home with family tonight. It's my family in Iowa. I love it being here. I love the worship. I love this church. Pastor Weaver called me many years ago. I did not know him. And I called someone my, to ask about who is this guy that's calling me. And uh, they said two things. You probably have lots of things in your mind. <laughs> I listened to him out front here, and um, he's, I mean, he's, he's a great man, he's a great pastor, he's a great preacher, he's also a great comedian, and I was listening to him out here, but that's not what I heard. I asked, who is Pastor James Weaver? And they said two things. Number one, he's a great discipler. He's a man that believes what Jesus said, that you should teach people to obey all the things that he commanded. And the second thing they said is that he has a giant heart for missions. And I found out those two things would be very true of your pastor. And I want to say thank you, Pastor Weaver, for calling me and giving me the opportunity to come and to be a partner with you. You guys have been strategic partners with us. You're going to get a chance to see tonight what happened because of your, your investment in the island of Sumba many years ago. I want to ask a question. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Basically what Pastor said. Follow what he said. Follow and obey the things that he said. This is one of the things he said. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. He said, actually, this was how to inherit the kingdom of God. This is how to make it to heaven. He said, this is actually the greatest commandment. There is no other commandments greater than these. Love the Lord your God. This means love God unconditionally, heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. The question I'm going to ask you tonight to think with me is what I'm personally challenged with right now as I'm walking in my own journey with God. What does it mean to love God unconditionally? What does it mean to love my neighbor as myself? Just like the guy in the story is talking to Jesus. He says, so who is my neighbor? I mean, is it the guy that lives next to me? Is it the guy that people in my neighborhood, people that I like, like my family, people that are not like me? Jesus tells the story about the neighbor. It's someone that showed mercy on someone that was in trouble. He said, you do this and you will live. You do this and you will inherit the kingdom of God. This neighbor that Jesus tells about was somebody from a different culture, a different language, a different race, a different religion. Very interesting. When we become a neighbor like Jesus talks about, you do for somebody else something that, you wish, that they would wish that they would, you would do for them. I mean, I want, if I was in trouble, I would want somebody to help me, like the story that Jesus tells. Someone beaten, robbed, left on the side of the road for dead. We'd want somebody to help us. That's what a neighbor does. I mean, this is the concept of missions. If I did not know the truth, I would want someone to guide me to the truth. If I was in a burning building, I did not know the building was burning. I did not know my life was at stake. I'd want someone, I'd want you to come and to help me out of the building, to show me the way out. This is Jesus with flesh on. We walk doing what Jesus would have done if he were standing in the flesh walking on the earth right next to our neighbors, those people that do not know. The question I'm asked, and I'm asking all the time of myself is, am I walking like Jesus would have walked in my place? Am I doing what Jesus would have done? The reason I'm here tonight is to say thank you to, to you, to New Hope, for all you have done for us in the island of Sumba. I don't think you will ever grasp the impact that you have had on this island. 
one and a half times the size of the greater Des Moines area, a million people. It's an island that's quite different from Des Moines. Let's do the video, sorry. Sumba is a primitive island, not a lot of hope. You see this building? This is built by New Hope, by your church. Fifteen years ago, we started this concept, and about a dozen years ago, we started to build this building. My first memory of Sumba was walk, watching the kids come home from school carrying their shoes. I'll never forget it. I asked the driver, what's going on? The pavement's hot. Are their shoes too small? He said, no, they're too valuable. I'll never forget going back to my house the next week and opening my closet and seeing all the shoes in my, on the floor. Well, what we do is we take in young people. We take in young people from the villages that have potential. They may be very intelligent. They may have music or some kind of talent, maybe a sports. Maybe they have leadership potential. We are basically taking in people and training and grooming them to become the next leaders of this island, the future leaders of Sumba, leaders that will make choices that will alter the course of history for this people. We are attempting to transform an island in a generation. Is it easy? No. Steeped in hundreds of years of, of cultural baggage, animistic religion, rituals, fear of spirits, true poverty, poor education. I mean, really, the people don't have any hope. The boys, without help, they're basically going to become just a very simple farmer, waiting for the rain once a year and planting corn one seed at a time. The girls, without education, will become basically slaves as they're bought in the old traditional um, system of of being purchased in the, ma the marriage systems. These people basically living like their ancestors did hundreds of years ago. No water, no electricity. They work every day just to survive. And one of the things that happens to me as I walk is I, I am very well aware, I ask myself the question, why in the world did I get blessed to be born in the USA? I mean, I could have been born in Sumba. And so just like Jesus says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. I ask myself the question on this island, what does that mean? If I had been a kid born in Sumba, what would I want someone to do for me? What would, would I want someone to help me with? And so we bring these kids to a modern complex with all kinds of opportunities. And the transformation process begins. I mean, initially they meet God. It's the eternal, internal stuff. It's for the first time they find out who Jesus is. They really get to know Christ and they have a relationship with him. And then they start to go to school, find out what it is, six days a week, not just like in the village once or twice when the teachers may come. They learn to eat three times a day, not just maybe once, the leftovers. You learn what it means to brush your teeth, wash your hands, how to have more than one pair of clothes, how to speak English, gain computer skills understand finance and business, they play sports, practice music. They have all kinds of skills and resources on the outside, but it is, it's the internal, what's going on inside of them that is so dramatic. As you watch, you can watch them for the first time. They, they can, their eyes brighten up and they can speak to you. They look at you in the eye and they can speak to you from their heart. It's transformation. What we're trying to do is shape the future leaders of Sumba because in the next 30 to 50 years, we will have, have trained, developed over 2,000 young people who will become the next political leaders, the next business leaders, the next educators, the next leaders of sports and music and entertainment systems. They will have transformed their family systems. Women, girls will have value and meaning. Something will happen and they will become the leaders who will take and make this island to have a different way of thinking. And I want to thank you for your partnership to bring transformation to an island in a generation. People ask me, Doug, can you really change a, a whole people? I mean, could you really change an island in a generation? Could you shape significant leaders, deliberately influence the social factors in the best 30 to 50 years, your whole life, and see what the disciples did, watch their world turn upside down? Is it possible? We're talking about the island of Sumba. It's primitive, still connected to the old ways, Muslim in the cities, animistic in the villages. They're cut, they're caught in between. And the question is, could these people be prepared? Could they transform their thinking? 
Could their education systems, their value systems, their finances, could it be changed? And could the next governor of Sumba become, come from the House of Hope? Could the next leaders of business come from the House of Hope? Could the next educators, could we actually develop the people that will lead the island? Well, we're trying to transform the systems. We do water outreach into the villages, showing we care for people. In an island that's dry, two months of rain and 10 months of drought, building wells and pipes and reservoirs and water tanks and bring the, the water truck from the House of Hope right next to our churches and we'll, you'll watch the people bring their water. They want to live. Water for drinking, for cooking, for bathing, for washing. In villages that don't have a lot of opportunity, we bring medical outreach. We, we do some kind of, how can you be Jesus? How can you not just pray for a person, but show them we care for where you're at, what's going on with your life. We want Jesus to be here in your place. An island that's gorgeous. Actually, this is, Sumba's being targeted to be the next Bali for Indonesia because it has gorgeous beaches. So now English is very important. People are coming in from all over the country, all over the world. And so our kids learn how to speak English and how to teach, how to coach English. We have over 75 kids that come every week and learn English on our campus. It's incredible to watch the transformation in people's thinking. Just like tonight when we were worshiping, I'd, I'd love to take your worship team. I'd like to steal them, actually. Take them to Sumba. To, in, our, in our island, we have a, a god. It's a, an animistic god. It's called Marapu. And this god is very distant. You can't have relationship and must be appeased by blood sacrifice. So every wedding, every funeral, there's always blood. There has to be blood. There has to be animals killed. We want people to know that they can stand in the presence of God. They can experience peace and, and healing and wholeness by just being with God, just like tonight as we were standing in God's presence. If you want to bring transformation to an island, to a family, to your kids, the, th the things are the exact same things. There, there are several factors that have to happen. Someone has to model the values. Jesus says the student will become like his teacher. That means must be that we have to become what we want other people to be. We have to, to visibly be seen because who we are is transferred. Kids learn by what they watch. It's caught, not just taught. Not only that must people model the values, there has to be a desire to influence other people. You have the values, but you don't share them. Nobody's going to be changed. And so our kids are all in this sense of mission. We want to change our lives, our families, our schools, our neighborhoods. There has to be a strategy, new, new strategy, new methods, new ways. Because what's happening is we're trying to change people's character, their values, their system, what's going on inside of them. It's basically a life transfer. It's what I was talking about with Pastor Weaver. Teaching people to obey, teaching people to change the way that they think, they live. And life transfer takes time, lots of time. I'm talking about not just a class, not just a service, not just once. It's a lot of time together, walking 24 hours a day, seven days a week. What Jesus did with the disciples, there has to be life transfer, change, and then it takes resources. There have to be tools and buildings and finances, staff and prayer. And you can't build a good soccer team unless you have a soccer ball. You need a soccer field. You need some tools. If you don't have those, it's just theory. But if you have the resources, you can actually take a, an average team and make them into a good team. A good team can become an excellent team. An excellent team can become a championship team. And that's what's happened with us. We're watching people transform. And then prayer. The most significant part of the process. In fact, our kids will tell you. They get up at five every morning to pray. And they will tell you. Everything that they do, they, they know, they're learning how to hear God. They're learning how to capture God's heart and his spirit. And one of the reasons I wanted to come tonight, I wanted to share, say to you, thank you for praying for me. When I walked in the door here and I had people tell me different times, I've been praying for you, I've been praying for you, how are you feeling? I will never forget waking up from this coma just a few months ago, seven, eight months ago. When Donnie, my youngest boy, was standing next to me at the hospital in Singapore. And I saw I was worried, I, was, I had tubes all in my mouth, my ties, hands were tied down, and I asked for something to write with, and I wrote, is it serious? He said, yeah. He said, but you cannot die. So there are too many people praying for you. You cannot die. And I want to thank you, because there are so many of you in this place that have prayed for me, seriously prayed for me, seriously interceded for me. 
And I want to say thank you. And not just for me, but for missionaries around the world. The reality is you, you cannot always know what's going on in those places. But I want to say thank you for interceding and praying for your missionaries that we can carry on and do what God has called us to do. I want to tell you about my oldest son. His name is Don. I met Don about, it was 2005, at a finance seminar I did in his village. Extremely bright, brilliant in fact. And I found out he worked out in the, in the fields, pushing a hand tractor. I asked him, why didn't you finish school? He said, well, I wanted to study, but my parents couldn't afford it. I asked him, what did they have to pay that he couldn't afford? Well, it was a giant fee, $7.50. So said to drop out of school. He came to live with, with me, and it's a, long, it's a long story, but in the process of the first two years, I watched his life change. He wouldn't talk in the beginning. In our place, we read the Bible around the table every day, and everybody has to share. And one day I said, Don, you know, you have to, you have to, you have to speak. And he just wouldn't, he just looked at the floor, very quiet, shy, didn't have any self-worth. And then one day, he just started weeping. And so we all just waited. I said, what's going on with you? And he said, I, I can't believe it. I can't believe that Jesus would care for somebody like me. I have nothing. First two years, he read through the entire Bible, and God changed his thinking and began to change his process. This guy loved kids. We would go to one of the schools, and some of the schools would meet in our churches, and in Billy Pinga, we went and sat in the first grade class one day, and he turned over to me, and he said, hey, can we go to the market and buy some pencils and, and paper and maybe some sandals for these kids? And we did. On the way back, he said, you know, when I went to elementary school, I always went barefoot, and I never had anything to write with. I didn't have any paper. He said, I always had to borrow it. And I watched him hand out backpacks to each of the kids in this first grade class with pencils and papers, and they all got sandals. And I mean, he was so proud to be able to give them something he never got. Don today is the leader of our ministry in Sumba. He's leading while I'm right here right now. In fact, they're up, been up praying around 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock this morning. And they're doing it right now. And I'm so excited. We do the same thing. We help kids around the island every year because we want to be Jesus with flesh on. Don loved to play soccer, and so he, every afternoon he started playing with the neighbor kids and 4 o'clock, and then it was 3 o'clock, then 2 o'clock, and then 1 o'clock, and... As soon as he got out of school, he'd run to the house of hope and want to play. And so finally he made the rules. You have to go home and you have to help your parents. You have to do your chores. Well, then the parents started coming to us and saying, what in the world did you do to my kid? I mean, he comes home, he wants to actually do this, these chores. He wants to clean, he wants to wash, he wants to, to help cook. Well, these guys got changed. John began to tell stories about how Jesus had changed him. We now have five soccer teams and the number one soccer team on the island. Go, assemblies of God, go, assemblies of God, go. I love to listen to these guys, these Muslims. Go, assemblies of God, I'm, going. I'm thinking, how incredible. This little ball has opened up every door for us, from the government on down. Incredible. Two years ago, Don was elected to be a representative, a youth representative in the island. It happened very funny for me because he didn't run. Other people were out campaigning and, and the night before the election they came and said, you already lead people, why don't you put your name in for the election? Well, he was elected the next morning. And so now he's being groomed to become the, the next the senator, the next representative for our, our island in Jakarta. And his goal now is to be the governor of the island in his lifetime. The question is what could happen to a person who has been transformed by Jesus? Could they become what God had intended for them from the very beginning? See, what's going on is we're looking, we're, we're, we're much smarter now than what we were in the beginning. We're saying, okay, these guys have potential. This person has, put, this person has a calling. This person has these abilities. These abilities. We want to write, help these kids to rise up and become everything that they can become for, for God. I'm watching these young people. <clears throat> they, they love to come home from the government offices. They say, they only type with two fingers. We can type with all ten. Uh, they love that. This island where people are very poor. I mean, really, real poverty. Teaching them to think differently about resources, about finances. How can you invest in an asset? How can you make money work for you? How can you advance and get out of poverty? 
So teaching kids how to, to take their, their money and to buy a little something, a little goat. Some of the products you see out here are this very thing, investing. And after, after a little $15 goat raise, gets older, you can sell it for $20, $30, $40. And then you don't spend the money, you buy two goats. And two goats become four goats, four goats become eight goats, eight goats become 16. All of our kids have more money than their parents. And they're excited, they say, we will not only change our lives, we will change our families, we will change our villages, we are going to change this island. There's a mentality that nothing is impossible. And so the models, what we're doing in front of these kids is saying, Jesus has come to break into your world and to show you that there is a full life. He said, I came to give you life and to give it abundantly. It's not just about getting rich, it's about becoming a new person, a new creation in Christ Jesus. And so this discipleship process being coupled with real leadership development where kids are becoming true leaders, and then all of a sudden it's mixed with this sense of mission. We are on a mission. We are going to change our world forever. I want to say thank you for doing that very thing. That's exactly what's going on. And I'm watching their thinking as their eyes, you can see like tumbling in their thinking. I watch these guys, this is our, our new experiment with a little boy, preschool. Well, he's in uh, kindergarten right now, Braden. We're trying elementary school kids now, saying, could we actually, we have 40 kids that live with us right now. We're looking at maybe a potential of 100 young people. You see, I'm asking this, this question. If you can have a, a Wati studying law at the university, Arnold studying information technology, Harrison, one of our coaches, Alfin finishing high school this month, wants to do business management. Arnie's one of the teachers in a village. Donnie's in musical school, wants to start a music school in Sumba. You know, what, what happens to these kids is that they, there's something inside of them. They have something. They didn't even know it. They didn't know they had these abilities. They didn't know had, they had these potent, this potential or these callings. But something rises up inside of a person that has opportunity, that is being challenged to reach to their heights of all they could be in Christ. And all of a sudden, when, when they have these potential and they're empowered and, and resourced, they're really willing to go out and change the world. They say, we can do this. These young people, coupled with our pastors and our churches, are saying, we can, we can do this. Mercy, a young girl from Kadumbu, lots of energy, lots of trouble. She, you know, we have a lot of rules if people don't follow them, we send them home because we have lots of people. We have over 100 kids that are on the waiting list. They want to come to live at the House of Hope. So she broke the rules. I called her parents. And I'll never forget her dad sitting in front of me and just weeping. Please don't send her home. Please don't send her home. She's my only hope. She's our only hope for our family, our village. And I sat there thinking, what, what am I supposed to do? I mean, I know what will happen to her when she goes home. I already know that. She'll immediately be married and she'll have kids. She will not have any future. And so we gave her another chance. Well, Mercy, she got very, very industrious and she began really studying serious and she started doing, she got an idea to teach English. She's the one that organized our English ministry, teaching 75 to 100 kids every week, doing games and activities with the neighbor kids. She's in university right now in Kupang studying English. She wants to start an English school in Sumba. And I think, what would have happened if I would have sent her home? What would have happened if she never came to the House of Hope? Marlon, same She's from a different village, Lindeha. Young girl, she came in, really studied hard for the first couple of years, and then all of a sudden she kind of got lazy and started slowing down, and then she came to me one day and she just said, I, I can't do it, it's too hard, I want to go home. So I said, no problem, I mean, this is, it's your choice, we don't force anybody, and so we called her parents. And her dad came and he spoke so harshly, words I would never repeat, and basically just said, you're stupid, you are, you are a girl and you have opportunities, you want to go home? No problem. He said, you're going home with me today. He said, in fact, you're going to get married next week. Someone already approached me. They've got two horses, three cows, two buffalo. So you're getting married next week. And all of a sudden, she just began to, to weep. I mean, it's like she just remembered she lives in Sumba. She just remembered she's a woman. She's a female. She's a that she, Without education, she has no choice. She has no voice. She has no options. And I looked at Don, and Don looked at me, and, and I just said, Marlon, do you want to go home, or do you want to stay? Oh, please, can I stay? Please, please. 
Two years ago, she finished high school. And she's in culinary school right now. She wants to start a restaurant in the island of Sumba. Onus, one of our young men, one of the best soccer players, but very, very quiet, never spoke, never said anything. In fact, I would ask him questions that everyone's supposed to share in the scriptures. He would never speak. So one day I said, Onus, you have, you have to speak. You have to talk. And finally he just said, you know, I don't really have anything to say. Well, when he said that, all of a sudden I saw his mouth. His front teeth were broken. I'm going, what in the world happened to your teeth? I said, open up your mouth. And I looked inside his mouth and all of his teeth were rotted down. I said, what happened to you? He said, you know, my mom died when I was just a little, little baby, a little kid. He said, and my dad didn't know what to do with this. We didn't have any TV or anything to keep us occupied, so he just gave me sugar. He always put sugar in my mouth and just said, keep this in your mouth. And I would just sit around with sugar. He said, until all my teeth were gone, my baby teeth and then my adult teeth. Well, I took him to the dentist, changed some, pulled some teeth and changed some things, and this is what happened. I will never forget this, this picture on the right. I said, well, you don't smile that way. He said, well, I never smiled before. This young kid that was so quiet, never could speak, has not only speaks now, but he's extremely loud. And this is what he said to me in January, right before I was getting ready to come back to the U.S. He said, I never had anyone who ever cared for me before. My own family never showed any interest in who I was. It was not until I came into the house of hope that I understood what the word family meant. And now I know what to do when I get married and I have my own kids. This is transformation. He's met God. Well, this is where we're going. I'm trying to do things that are beyond what a human being could do. I'm trying to build some buildings, trying to resource our pastors. I'm trying to say, what does God want to do? Somebody, I, I talked to my brother and I said, Greg, do you think I'm crazy? He said, Doug, if your dreams are not bigger than your budget, they're not God's dreams. I'm trying to build this big building. It's actually already built. Well, we're trying to build a dorm for the boys. I want to, enlar- I want to be able to reach 100 boys. I want to be- reach 100 girls. We have a Pasantran, a Muslim school in Wangapu that has 1,000 young people. So why can't we have Christian opportunities for our kids? There's this building in the center of the city called we're wanting to build a dream center in it. It's major money. I want to buy a, build a, buy a property right next to us. It's just opened up this last week for around $10,000 for practice field for soccer. I want to resource our pastors. You know, I don't know how much money you give in the offering. It's not my business, really. But this is the average offering in Sumba. It's 1,000 rupiah. This is seven cents. So if a family gives seven cents, and there are 10 families in the church, that's 70 cents for the week. That's the pastor's offering. And then for one month, that means it's $2.80. I found this out by really arguing with my pastor, saying, you guys are not paying your tithe. You're only paying 30 cents. One pastor's paying 42 cents. And I'm going, what, what kind of tithe is that? He said, well, that's, that's the offering that came in. We didn't have any more than that. I started watching them, they're all malnourished, just like my kids. The, the, the thing in Sumba, what, what happens when our kids come in, in the beginning, I mean, the system is the wife cooks, the husband eats. The wife eats the leftovers. If there's anything left for the three to five to 10, 12 kids, they all fight over whatever's left. And so all of our kids are malnourished when they come in, and I, and I watch them. They'll, they'll pile their plate full of rice. It's a mountain. Then the next week, the second or third week, it'll be a hill. And then after three or four weeks, it'll be down to a normal plate. Because they've never, they just learned how to live hungry. And so when, I heard one of my pastors saying this a few months ago. He said, you know, I'd really, rather live at the House of Hope. He said, because you guys eat every week. And I'm just thinking, you know, this is not fair. This is the reality. This is not fair. Life is not fair. Life isn't fair. I'm thinking through, what does it mean to follow Jesus? What does that mean? What does it mean to love my neighbor as myself? What does that mean? Well, I know what Jesus is going to say to us someday. He's going to say, well, you know, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I didn't have clothes, you helped me. I was in prison, I was sick, and you looked after me. Because when you did it to one of the least of these, one of these 
young men, one of these young women, you did it to me. What Jesus would say to me is probably what he'd say to you. There's two things you need to do with your life. You need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You need to love your neighbors yourself. Your neighbor right here in Urbandale in Des Moines and your neighbor, neighbors around the world. That even includes people over in the islands, even to Sumba. I don't know what that means for you tonight. I know what it means for me. I am trying to find God. How do I walk in your steps? How to respond to your call? All I'm, I'm ask, not actually asking for your money, to be honest with you. I'm asking to pray for resources. Because I told my brother, I said, I'm trying to, to look for resources that are over $2 million. I know it's not realistic. I know that. But I do believe that God has the cattle on a thousand hills. I do believe that. I believe that when I saw my grandpa pray for people that were dead, that were sick, in wheelchairs, they came up, they came up, three people from the dead, come back to life. People that could not walk, canes and crutches and braces, they walked. Animals, broken legs, stand up, walk and run again. I've, I believe, I've watched my dad pray for kids that were blind, they saw. I know that my God can do anything, and I'm asking you to pray with me for God to release his resources, because what I found out is that he cares for these people. You see, this started when Pastor Weaver called me. He said, we want to help, we want to do something. I never, I didn't even know who this guy was. I came and met him for lunch. He said, I want to invest in what you're doing. I left, and I did not know if he was telling the truth, but the next week I got a check in the mail and we built that first dorm, and your church, church continued to invest, and heavily invest. And Julie came over and she invested more. And what happened is lives began to change, and today we see what was going on. I had no clue, no idea, I had no plan. But I'll tell you who had a plan, God had a plan, because he cares for people. And I wanna say thank you for your investment, thank you for your prayers, thank you for your partnership. Thank you. God bless you.